Hey, welcome everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I'm Andy Leach, the Senior Director of Museum and Archival Collections here at the Rock Hall. And I'm so excited to be hosting this event featuring the legendary Roger McGuinn, who was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1991 as a member of the Birds. Uh, I'm gonna be talking with Roger about this fantastic and enjoyable new book that's right behind me, The Birds, 1964 to 1967, which is a beautiful, large format, tabletop collectible, art book that was put together by the Bird's three surviving founding members, uh, Roger, as well as Chris Hillman and David Crosby. And it gives a really unique visual history of the band through an amazing collection of photographs. Uh, and we're gonna see some of those. I encourage you to check out the Rock Hall's online store where we have copies of the new book for sale. And it's actually available in three versions from BMG Books. And here at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, we're going to have copies of the standard edition for sale in our store, both here at our museum and our online store. So make sure to come to our museum or go to rockhall.com to get one of those. I also want to mention uh, that you'll be able to hear this interview sometime in the coming weeks on the SiriusXM platform. So please stay tuned for that. And without further delay, uh, I couldn't be more thrilled to welcome founding member of the Birds and Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee, Roger McGuinn. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. Um, yes. Thanks so much for joining us, Roger. Um, I, I really loved reading through the book and really enjoyed all the photos and, um, and especially all the commentary and reflections that are kind of shared by you and Chris and David throughout, throughout the book. Um, it's, to me, it's a lot like going through a photo album with three of you there to kind of tell the story uh, or the stories around what we're seeing. Uh, yes. Really well done. It's kind of a documentary. I mean, I, I got that when I read it. It was it was like the whole story of the birds. Absolutely, yeah. Can you can you talk about how the book came about? Well, Chris Hillman did a book a couple of years ago for BMG, and they had a lot of photos uh, left over. And they said, "What are we going to do with these photos?" I said, "Oh, I know. Let's let's do a birds book." And they had some wonderful stuff. So uh, they got it from five or six different sources. Yeah, it's. It's really incredible. There's a lot of photos that even as a Birds fan, I had not seen a lot of them before. Um, and it's really, you know, um, kind of enlightening to focus on the imagery of the Birds. Um, you know, the influence of the band on music, of course, is, is massive. But um, I think that influence reached beyond just music. Um, and the intro of the book kind of talks about this a little bit, how, that you guys were really trendsetters and kind of helped create the image for what bands in that scene not only sounded like but what they looked like and um and, it, and it's also kind of remarkable to see how quickly uh the image changes as fashion changes so qu quickly in that era right well when we started out we uh, looked kind of like the kingston trio we were all from a folk background more of the commercial side of folk music and as time went on well, we saw the beatles movie a hard day's night and they influenced us in how we dressed we got these uh, black velvet suits that you can see in the beginning of the book with uh, co collars and black suits with velvet collars and we wore them for uh, i guess a couple of photo shoots and at Ciro's for about a week until they got stolen. And I remember I told John Lennon, our suits got stolen. He said, I wish they'd sold, stolen our suits. <laughs> That's great. Um, well, I do wanna show like a, a really early photo that really does kind of illustrate that Kingston Trio kind of style. And that is um, this early photo from 1964 when you and Gene Clark and David Crosby were known as the Jet Set, right? Right. Well, we were toying around with the name. Uh, manager Jim Dixon didn't think it was appropriate for rock and roll. So we, we didn't really, we weren't seriously ever going to be the jet set, but it was just a name we were throwing around. It was uh, later we were invited to Thanksgiving dinner at our manager's house. And that's where we came up with the name The Birds. That's great. Can you talk about just how the, the three of you came together? Okay, I was doing solo work in New York. I, I'd been working for Bobby Darren in the Brill Building as a songwriter. And at night, I'd go down to Greenwich Village and, and play uh, in the coffee houses where you pass a hat around. And the Beatles came out and they, they influenced me. I went, wow, they're, they're, using, they're using rock and roll chords. I mean, folk music chords in their rock and roll. A million folk songs have these chords. I went, wow, they're using folk music chords and rock and roll, what a great idea. And I started playing some Beatles songs and some folk songs that were uh, influenced by the Beatles at the coffee houses and nobody liked it. 
except the guy who ran it. He put a sign outside the door that said Beatle impersonations. And this is New York. I thought, uh oh, this is embarrassing. And, and the tourist buses were coming around. I, I said, I got to get out of New York. So I flew to LA and got a, a job at the Troubadour Folk Club opening up for Hoyt Axton. Mm -hmm. And I was doing pretty much the same material there. And there was only one guy who liked it. It was Gene Clark. And he'd just been in the Christie Minstrels. He came backstage and said, I get what you're doing. I like the Beatles. I like folk music. Let's write some songs and see what happens. So we started writing songs in the Troubadour, in the front room. It was a place you could hang out all day. And David Crosby came in and started singing harmony with us. And he said, I want to be in your band. Mm -hmm. I said, well, we don't really have a band, David. We're just kind of writing some songs here. He said, oh, come on, man. If I can be in your band, I know this guy's got a recording studio we could use for free. I said, you're in. And that was the beginning of it. That's great. Yeah. And I remember in because I, I read uh, Chris Hillman's book last year, and I remember him talking about seeing you, I think, at the Troubadour, uh, maybe doing I Want to Hold Your Hand or uh, one of the Beatles tunes, right? Right. They had open mics at Hootenanny Night, and I used to get up and do Beatles songs or whatever. Yeah. Um, well, so not long after um, this period we were just looking at, um, you uh, recruited Chris and then and also Michael Clark and and then became the Birds and you were signed to Columbia Records and this photo we have here um, coming up I think this was taken in uh, one of the Columbia studios right yeah it was just a photo shoot it wasn't a real recording session mm -hmm. okay and and I know I think uh, there were some co comments um, from you maybe on, not on this particular photo but pointing out. Um, that you know, Michael Clark's drums aren't quite set the way they maybe ended up later, and and Chris is still playing a cheap bass, and people are still learning their instrument, or th those two guys especially were learning their instruments, right? Right. Um, well, David Sheen and I were pretty good guitar players, and um, and Chris was an excellent guitar player and mandolin player, but I don't think Michael had ever played the drums before, and they are uh, set up with the snare kind of facing down, which was backwards it should be facing toward him so right. I didn't, didn't get that right but he he became a really good drummer but it took a while Absolutely. I remember uh, we used the wrecking crew for the first session of Mr. Tambourine Man and the flip side I knew I'd want you and they knocked it out in one three-hour session and then all the birds said no oh, no we want to play on our own records like the Beatles and they got to but it took 77 takes to get turn 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 on the second one right um, well, you know, and, and just thinking about that song and, and a lot of those, those early ones, especially that no other band really sounded like the Birds. And I think it was due to a lot of factors. I mean, of course, your 12 string and, and you know, David's backing vocals are completely, you know, unique and amazing. And then I do think it's Chris, the way he played bass because he was a mandolin player and, and even um, and Michael, you know, the, the, his drumming is unique, too. Right. Right. He had been a conga player. I met him up in North Beach in California earlier before the birds. And he was a good conga player. So he had a sense of rhythm and time. It, it didn't take him long to pick up the drums. Yeah. Well, uh, we talked uh, we talked earlier, you, you mentioned uh, Ciro's and we, we actually have a cool shot here uh, of uh, one night. I think this is probably in early 1965 when Bob Dylan uh, showed up and joined the band on stage. So I think we have that photo right here. There's Bob um, with the harmonica, right? Yeah. You any memories of that night in particular? Well, it was great. I'd met Bob uh, back in the village when I lived in the village, and uh, probably in '62, '63, he was playing Gertie's Folk City, and I didn't know him well, but I, I I knew him to say hello to, and then he showed up, and he was a friend of Jim Dixon's, who was our first manager. And Jim had heard Bob's version of Mr. Tambourine Man that went something like a... Well, he, Mr. Tambourine Man, play a song for me. I'm not sleepy and there's no place I'm going to. Hey, Mr. Tambourine Man, play a song for me. In the jingle jangle morning I'll come Halloween. And Crosby said, I don't like it, man. He said that folky two, four times, not going to play on the radio. And he was right because radio was playing rock and roll, the Beatles and the Stones. And they weren't playing much two, four music. It was all four, four. So I rearranged the song with a... <laughs> Put that riff on it. 
and uh, we cut it down to one verse. It was about four and a half minutes long prior to that, and it played on the radio. Yeah, uh, yeah. what an iconic sound, too. Uh, it just sort of, you know, um, brings us back to that time. Uh, and, um, and of course, um, this book, too, it, it really, um, in addition to live shots, there's some great photos of you guys in the studio. Um, and, and I know a lot of these are probably staged as photo ops, like you mentioned uh, the earlier one, but we have one here uh, or a couple here, I think, where you can see you guys kind of gathered around microphones. And, and I think you even comment in the book that some of these are sort of probably photo ops, right? Right, they were posed. We, we didn't record all three of us in front of one microphone. We, we used separate mics and, and mixed them in the board. Yeah. And then, and then this one, um, this kind of connects to Mr. Tambourine Man, I think, because it's kind of a mystery photo where we're seeing session musicians, but we're also seeing members of the birds there with their instruments. So it's kind of a, a, a mystery, right? What, what was going yeah, on? I think that was uh, staged because there's Terry Melcher in the middle and um, some of the birds and some session guys from the wrecking crew, but that wasn't a real session. That was like some of those guys just happened to be in the picture, uh, the the actual session with the wrecking crew was was Hal Blaine, Jerry Cole, um, it had like let's see, uh, oh, Bill Pittman, Leon uh, Russell, and uh, right. a couple of guys. Any, anyway, it was just them and me because I'd, I'd been a studio musician in New York, and they let me play on it. And I also had the lick the. Uh, <laughs> the Rickenbacker 12 strings that I got to play. Yeah. But it wasn't like that picture. No, that, that was a staged look. Sure. Very cool. Well, um, there's uh, there are also some great shots in the book of, of um, sort of how the fashion was changing and how you, you were changing it. There's a great shot we have here of your iconic glasses, um, these cobalt blue lenses. Uh, can you talk about uh, how you ended up with these? Yeah, um, when I was living in the village, I was walking down McDougal Street and John Sebastian, who was later in the Love and Spoonful, was walking north and he had these antique cobalt blue glasses on. And it was about three o'clock in the morning and I said, oh man, those are cool shades. He said, yeah, try them on and look up at the street light and move your head around. It's really groovy. <laughs> so I did that and I thought, wow, these are cool. So when I got out to LA and we made a little money, I bought some wire frames and took them to the optometrist and had pre prescription lenses put in in cobalt blue. And they were just my glasses. I, I wore them all the time. Yeah. And I think in the book, you tell a couple of funny stories about how different pairs of these glasses got either stolen or, or lost in different ways, right? Yeah, I only had one pair at first. And then we were in Chicago doing an in-store promotion and going down an escalator at uh, one of the stores in Chicago. And all these young women fans were uh, on either side of the escalator. And one of them just grabbed my glasses off my face. And that was the end of them. I, I never saw them again. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a great shot, too, in the, in the book um, that I, we've got here that shows, again, like the, the influence that you were having beyond just the musical influence, you can actually see a fan here in the audience wearing those uh, same kinds of kind of glasses as yours, right? At that point, you could walk into any drugstore in the country and find a card with about uh, 10 or 20 uh, pair of glasses on there for a buck a piece. <laughs> did, did you often see people in, in the audience like this uh, kind of reflecting back the, your, yeah. your fashion? We did. We saw them, they, you know, maybe one or two. Not everybody oh. wore them, but uh, they were a fad for a while. Yeah. Um, well, another thing that's um, that's really fun about the book, uh, especially for for those of us who are Birds fans who've kind of stared at these album covers for for so many years, is um, that the book includes a lot of alternate shots from some of those photo shoots, um, including a, a few we have here by Barry Feinstein. Um, and this is for the the shoot for the cover of Mr. Tambourine Man. Um, very cool use of the fisheye lens, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Barry was, um, I, I think that was a new lens at the time. He was married to Mary Travers from Peter, Paul and Mary. And right. he was a friend of Jim Dixon's and he came to LA and we went to Griffith Park to shoot the session there. And that yellow leather jacket um, was given to me by Dino Valenti because he was a friend of mine up North in San Francisco. 
And I, I loaned it to Marty Stewart, who's starting a museum of uh, rock and roll memorabilia uh -huh. in uh, Mississippi. So that's where it is now. But yeah, it was a great session. And you can see our suits got our suits got stolen. So we're wearing T-shirts and jeans. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Marty, I think um, he's, yeah, he's starting the Congress of Country Music. And I think he he has some of your uh, some stuff that maybe you uh, owned back in the day. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, can, do you, just thinking about different photographers you, you um, worked with and who are featured in the book, um, can you talk about uh, any recollections you, you remember about Barry Feinstein, for example? Well, Barry went on the road with us on our first uh, bus tour and with the dancers and everything, and he, he photographed a lot of that. And he was very cool, and we, we hung out together. And then uh, there's Jim Marshall was one of our photographers. Yeah, and we actually have a photo, uh, some photos right here. Mm hmm. Cool. Great stuff. Um, what was it like working with him? It was very professional. He, he was really great. That's great. Um, and another, you know, another great photographer who we we all love um, and we have a, a collection of some of his photos here is Henry Diltz. And I believe um, he yeah. may, may have even shot that early photo of the jet set, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but also he probably did, yeah. Well, I knew him from the Modern Folk Quartet. He, he was in a band uh, called the Modern Folk Quartet and a great banjo player. And he took up the camera and became even a more famous photographer. And he was had a great eye for get, getting that stuff. And we knew him. He was our buddy. So he had access. Right. And I think he shot these these beautiful photos we're seeing here that were taken somewhere in the Midwest, right, when the birds were on tour. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think this was probably 1965. Um, it would, yeah, yeah, it would be um, probably in uh, the summer of 65. Yeah, yeah, um, just really beautifully shot photos that, again, I hadn't seen a lot of these before, and um, it's it makes it worth getting getting the book for for fans of the band. Um, also, uh, what's cool about this Midwest tour, and I don't, there's some great photos of you um, interacting with kids, kind of near the tour bus and um right right yeah talking to kids by the bus in the front of the bus yeah and it, i i just have to imagine in that time um you guys must have looked pretty unique to to folks sort of living out in the mid in the middle of nowhere right <laughs> yeah well in the midwest especially since we have these wild dancers the uh, Vito's gang dancers were, you know, they, they were dressed like hippies and they, they danced around. <laughs> it, was, it was an amazing sight. Yeah. But yeah, it's just, it's got really uh, very cool to see you kind of hanging out, talking to the kids. And I'm sure, uh, you know, and I think there's even some maybe quotes from uh, Chris saying like, you know, especially you looked like you were from another planet, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. We did. yeah, we were yeah. out there. Um. Well, uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, great on stage photos as well in the um, in the book, and I think um, what they're they're very enlightening because they kind of show um, kind of what it was like on stage back then. I I know here we're already probably in 1966 because it's after Gene had left the band in um, I think in February of that year, so you're playing as a four piece. But I think you point out um, in one of the comments that it really shows um, kind of what the being on stage back then was. And I think in the next photo, we can see you have no monitors, um, the cables are all stretched out and just uh, how different it is from live shows now, right? Oh uh, yeah, it was years before they got the uh, sound uh, equipment together. We had no monitors. So you had, had to, if you were in an indoor venue, you had to wait till the sound uh, bounced off the wall in the back of the room. And there's a little Doppler shift, so you had to make sure you were, weren't singing out of tune. And then we really couldn't hear each other because they were like 10, 15 feet away. So what we had to sing to was just our amplifier, uh, whatever notes were coming out of the guitar, you sang along with that. And it was really less than ideal. Plus, you'd get electrical shocks from the microphones because sometimes they, they, they didn't balance the, the electricity properly. And so it, was, it wouldn't kill you. Uh, but it was a shock. You get it in your mouth. That would hurt. Yeah, that I've I've experienced that even today, and that does hurt. Yeah. Um, um, there's a cool image here too. Uh, the next one is um, just shows the, from behind the drums. It's just a really uh, cool shot, and I can't remember at the moment who might have taken this, but um, 
just really, um, really cool to see just how sparse everything is on stage back then. Mm -hmm. Also, we were playing high school gyms and, you know, they weren't proper venues. They weren't theaters. They, they didn't have seating. Everybody was standing up and crowding toward the stage. And sometimes the fans would rush the stage and then the police would come out with billy clubs. And <laughs> it was like that first picture you showed and the, the bunch of guys with billy clubs st stopping the, the fans from approaching the stage and then cancel the concert after one song or two songs. Right. I think there's a quote from you um, in the book talking about how you'd all been, you'd all seen a hard day's night, of course, and were influenced by it uh, in a big way, but it was, and how it, it must've been pretty cool to sort of start experiencing that kind of fandom, right? It was, it was an overnight thing. I mean, we, we'd been scuffling for a couple of years, learning how to do our, our craft and, and being a dance band at Zero's and learning how to uh, keep a beat because we were folk musicians and a beat wasn't that important in folk music, but it was if you're a dance band, because if you get the beat wrong, people fall down. So yeah, yeah. yeah. we, we um, <clears throat> took a while to get our rhythm together. And it, it was an amazing experience. I, I think the most fun part of it was getting it all together and then getting a couple of number ones and man, meeting the Beatles and hanging out with the Rolling Stones. And it was really something. Sure. There's a, actually a good story uh, that you tell in the book, I think about the Rolling Stones, you're opening for the Stones and they, um, at some point they, they were running late. Is that, does that sound yeah. right? Yeah, we only knew about 10 songs and we had exhausted our entire repertoire and, and the uh, promoter of the concert was over in the wings going stretch, stretch, you know, we didn't know any more bird songs. So we started doing uh, <laughs> love, love, laughing away, love, love, laughing away. And Mick right. Jagger walked in while we were doing that. Right. Their version of the, the Buddy Holly hit, right? Yeah. That's great. Um, so uh, as, as we move forward, you, you, um, you, guys recorded the fifth dimension album and, and at this point you know uh, gene clark had left the band um and um, i think you even talk about a little bit in the book that um you know things weren't maybe weren't as as great musically in your mind without gene right uh, maybe just oh, yeah. the, the songs he brought and his voice right well, we missed we missed him in a couple of ways we, we missed his songwriting his singing and his looks because people the kids love gene and they'd say where's gene when we'd be on stage so yeah we missed him a lot yeah and then um and this is reflected here in the in these um these photos from the photo shoot for the fifth dimension album cover and again the styles are, are changing again um quite a bit and um you're you're wearing the ray-bans instead of the uh, the cobalt uh, glasses, right? Yeah, well, I lost the granny glasses. The um, the time in Chicago was one time, but, but the Columbia Records bought me some more. So we went down to the Bahamas and rented motorbikes. And I was riding around Nassau in a motorbike and the glasses blew off and fell in the bushes. And they're, they're probably still there. <laughs> right. Um, and then the, there's also this um, magic carpet idea that um, I think, it seems like based on the comments from, from you and Chris and David, that, that this was not a, an idea that came from the band, right? No, it was, uh, well, all, all the photos we did were Columbia Records art department ideas. We, we never came up with any, any photo ideas. And the uh, scene you're seeing is from the song Going Back and it's got a, a line, a magic carpet ride in it. Right, absolutely, right. Um, well, another, um, Another photographer that I wanted to mention who's featured in the book a bit is uh, the great Linda Eastman, um, who later became Linda McCartney, as we all know. And yeah. um, I, there's some really cool, um, nice photos, just sort of candid photos of, of you all. And uh, just wondered if there are any memories uh, you, you have of working with her or just getting to know her. I don't think we got to know each other during those sessions, but I did get to know her a little bit later when uh, Paul was playing in LA at the forum and it was sold out. And I, I called the forum and I got somebody backstage and I said, uh, I'd like to talk to Paul McCartney. He said, okay. So <laughs> Paul got on the phone. He said, is this Jim McGuinn? I said, yeah. He said, um, I, I said, I, I'd like to go to your concert, but I can't buy tickets. They're all sold out. He said, you don't need tickets. Come on backstage and I'll take it. So I hung out back with Paul and Linda and it was really amazing. Yeah, very nice. Um, well, we also have some 
some uh, cool shots from a photo shoot for, for the Younger Than Yesterday album cover. And um, I think it's fun to just kind of peruse this section of the book and see these all these different poses that were tried out, but maybe didn't make it into the final version. But a couple of them were kind of integrated into that final cover, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think they superimposed a few of them. And we've got um, the final version here. Younger Than Yesterday, yeah. It was, um, based on the Bob Dylan song, My Back Pages. Right, yeah. That's uh, one of my favorite Birds records for sure. And and Chris Hillman is um, really really steps up at, at this moment and writes a lot of great songs. Yeah, that's, he, he bloomed. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and Clarence White, I think might make, maybe it makes his first appearance on, on here unless it happened earlier. No, I think uh, I think that was, a, I, Chris brought him over and they, they'd known each other in bluegrass. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, one thing that I, I saw that I really enjoyed uh, seeing in in a lot all these great photos is that you yourself were interested in cameras, right? And and so you see, um, there's a few examples of this where you're you, you're holding a camera. In this case, it looks like you're holding um, uh, a camera that you ended up shooting footage with um, at the time. Yeah. We, yeah, go ahead. It was a Bo, it was a Bolex RX 16, 16 millimeter film camera, and the idea was to film some scenes that we could rear project on stage. Uh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and yeah I, it's, that never ended up happening. Although uh, some years later, I, I loaned the reel to Whiskey A Go Go, and they used to use it in their club. Okay. And, I, and did some of the footage you shot with that camera ended up in the Echo in the Canyon documentary? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it Very did. Cool. It, was and, that? And, Andrew ahead. Slater. Andrew Slater. I don't know where he got the footage. He, he might have got it, gotten it off of YouTube, or I don't remember giving it to him, but I was pleased to see it in there. I was going, wow, that's my footage <laughs> in a real movie. <laughs> that's great. And was that the camera that you would have used when to capture when Chris's house Burned, um, no, no, okay. uh, that was a different camera. Um, I bought a um, an Ampex black and white video recorder, it was the size of, of a like a Footlocker. It was wood. It was about maybe two and a half feet high and four feet long, and it took reel to reel tape, two inch reel to reel tape, and it was black and white. And you had to plug an external camera into it. So I I had an external. It's like a video camera. It was black and white as well with a 20 foot cable. And I went outside to test the camera and I looked over and there was house, the house was on fire next, you know, down the road. So it was Chris's house. Right. And we see that house in a couple of photos, I think in, in the book too. Yeah, it was a great house. It's like um, his motorcycle was leaking fuel and the water heater set it on fire. Yeah, yeah, it does look like a beautiful, beautiful house from what I've seen in the photos. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, we next we have some shots from the photo shoot for your uh, 1967 Greatest Hits album, and um, again the styles are changing quickly. And um, I think Chris points out in the comments that you you've got a goatee, which is kind of ahead of the you were kind of ahead of your time there. Not not too many uh, folks in rock and roll, at least at that point had goatees and we have David with his hat right yeah David's uh, going full Russian <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he looks like a Cossack and uh, I'd worked uh, with Bobby Darren and uh, his uh, piano player had a goatee so that was I, it was also sort of a Greenwich Village influence I'd seen in the village right uh, uh, did, Peter Yarrow had one okay okay yeah that's right that's right and I guess John Phillips had a hat sort of like this one, right? That, he did. He might have been the inspiration for David's hat. Yeah. Um, just based on how quickly the styles are obviously changing, you know, as we just flip pages of the book, um, did it feel that way at the time that things were happening in a quick? It, it was a whirlwind. Okay. Was, everything was going so fast, you really couldn't keep track of it. It was just happening and happening and happening. Just tried to stay sane. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I think you mentioned in the book too that you um, you you weren't consciously kind of trying to make these, trying to look one way or another. It was just the way you wanted to be, right? 
I think so. I mean, image was always important. I remember even back in folk music, uh, folk musicians would concentrate on like wearing a vest or, you know, some sort of image thing that they would do visually. So it was something that I picked up being in the business for, I'd been in the business five or six years before the birds. Yeah. Well, um, as, as we move forward a little bit in the book, um, we're, we, as we get toward the end um, of this era, uh, we have some photos that show the, the final shows that you did with David Crosby. I think these are in, the, in, the, in September of 1967, and you did some final shows at the Fillmore. Is that right? Yeah, we, I think we were um, there for a few days, a week or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I think there's really actually some really insightful kind of recollections from, from all three of you about how his departure came about. Um, yeah, um, any, any memories of just the, the Fillmore in general uh, for you? I know you played there many times after that too. Yeah, well, it was a premier gig in San Francisco and also New York later. So it was um, a great place to play. Everybody had a good time. Everybody yeah. loved it. Yeah. Um, well, what's also interesting is after David leaves, you, there, there are these um, really cool photos from um, the Smothers Brothers show in late 1967, which included Gene, who just kind of returned for a few weeks. Um, yeah. And there's some really cool, uh, really good quality videos. You can watch that whole performance on YouTube. Right. Um, any recollections of that of that show or that time? Yeah, well, I, I had known Tommy and Dickie Smothers for years because we were all folk singers together and everything. So we were invited on the Smothers Brothers show and we did Mr. Spaceman and they did this um, sort of green screen thing of a flying saucer we were flying around in. It. And we did invite Gene back. It was Chris's idea. He said, we need some rhythm guitar. We were missing that when we went out as a trio uh, with Kevin Kelly and, and uh, Chris and I. It, it wasn't, it didn't have the punch that you needed. So we, we invited Gene to come back, but unfortunately his fear of flying got to him again and he quit after a couple of weeks. But we did the show, the TV show together. Right, right. Yeah, it's a really, it's a really cool um, performance uh, to, to watch actually. And it's interesting because I think Mr. Spaceman is probably about a year earlier um, right. at that point, but it's, it works well in that, in that setting. Yes, it did. <laughs> TV magic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so then you and, and Chris and Michael kind of went on um, as a three piece band for a while. And there are some photos showing you, you all playing shows as a three piece. Um, and then um, you end up uh, doing um, the notorious bird brothers album, um, or you should at least do the photo shoot as a trio. I think you'd already recorded some of yeah. this before. Um, but uh, yeah, this is, these are some great uh, photos just showing kind of outtakes, I guess, from that photo uh -huh. shoot. Yeah. Yeah, we were up, I guess, in Topanga or somewhere. There's that old house there, abandoned. And we had horses and we were riding around. And, and Michael brought his horse into the uh, house, sticking out the window. Right. It's not supposed to symbolize David Crosby. No, <laughs> no, no, we didn't think of that. Right now, um, and uh, and really, I guess this this it's a great it's a great album. I mean, it, the, the whole the whole stretch of the whole run of albums uh, that this book um, kind of captures is it, that whole period are are fantastic. And I this is one of my favorites too, the Notorious Bird Brothers album. Um, but it kind of marks the end of of that whole era. Right. Um, that the book celebrates. Um, you kind of went on with Chris to restructure things a little bit, did one more album with Chris, the great mm -hmm. sweetheart of the rodeo. Yeah. Uh, and then and the, Graham. And with Graham. Yeah. And, yeah. and you, and the band, and then the, the birds kept evolving from there too. Right. Right. Well, I, I looked at it as a brand name, like Coca-Cola. So I, I thought, you know, it's a shame to throw it away. Even all the original members had left, but but we got Clarence White and Gene Parsons and uh, John York at first and then skipped that. And it was really a good performing band, probably the best birds performing band ever. And I remember uh, playing the Fillmore East the first time the audience saw Clarence White, they just freaked out. He uh, was so hot. <laughs> yeah. What, yeah. What an amazing talent he was. Yeah. He's, he's one of my, absolute heroes too mine too and he was a good friend of mine you know sure. he was at my birthday party the night before he got hit by a car 
and we talked about working together. He said, it doesn't have to be the birds. Let's just do some stuff together. And I said, yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, yeah. What an amazing, amazing player. And yeah, what, what a great band. In fact, you can find um, great performances of that iteration of the band on YouTube. There's some, some fantastic performances. What a yeah. great rhythm section. Great, great all around. Yeah. Um, well, uh, then from there, though, uh, what's great about the book is it kind of comes full circle. And I, th I feel like I think the section is called full circle in this part of the book where we get to see these great photos, which I think are, again, by Henry Diltz right. of the 1972 reunion of the birds, where the original five members came back together to record again. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, do you, and I, could you talk about that experience a little bit? All I have to say about that was it was a great party. <laughs> it was a great, a long party and it was really good. Um, David was producing and he was sort of the big guy at that point. And it's a little weighted on that side. He didn't use a, a, a lot of Rickenbacker 12 string or whatever, but it was, I thought it was a good album and yep. a lot of people like it now. It, it didn't live up to the expectations of Birds fans back in the day. But I think it's a good album. I, I think it was not a commercial failure either. I think it, it sold pretty well. I think it got up on the charts. Okay. Yeah, and it's it doesn't try to go back and be what you the, the original five members were. It's it sort of is a progression. I think it's I think it's a great album. Well, my favorite part is, is um, probably Gene Clark's input. He, he had the best stuff, I think. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And he was he had some great solo records and during that that period. Oh yeah. Um, so, um, the final image in the book, um, is, is actually one that we at the Rock Hall helped you track down, uh, for the book. And, and, um, this was January of 1991. And I, it was the first time you'd all been together since the, the, uh, reunion album, um, which I think came out in 73, but this is when you were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1991, right? Right. That was the night. Yeah, and there was a Gulf War going on. They, they debated whether or not to keep the ceremony happening, but we decided it was worth it. And uh, let's see, John Lee Hooker, and who, who else uh, inducted that night? It was really a special night. And we all got to hang out at the same table. Well, they, they had put Michael Clark at, at the, Don Henley's table, but my wife went over and grabbed him and brought him up to our table. <laughs> That's right. And Don Henley actually inducted you, right? Gave the Yes, he did. He did a wonderful speech, too. Yeah, he did. Um, and it turns out, you know, sadly, this turned out to be the last time that the five of you were all together uh, in one yeah. place, right? Yeah, Michael and Gene died shortly after that. Right, right. Um, what, what, can you reflect on kind of what it meant to you at the time uh, to be inducted into the Rock Hall and, and what it means it's a great honor. It's a great honor. Um, people are impressed by it. You know, it's like in baseball and football, say, oh, Hall of Famer, you know, that's a big deal. Big yep. deal. Yeah. Um, well, um, just thinking about, um, as just wrapping up here, any surprises uh, for you as you were going through the, these photos or were there any you, you had never seen before? There was uh, a couple of things in the text. I, I was surprised that David Crosby didn't remember the night we were on the Ed Sullivan show very well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, I know Chris remembers it because I, Oh yeah. I remember it very well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's an interesting story. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, and you didn't get to, you didn't get to go back on the show. It sounds no, like. No, we did two songs and that was it. We, we were 86th. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, any, uh, any favorites uh, in the book in terms of photos or any moments that... No, I just like the whole thing. You know, I, it, it is like a little uh, documentary, as like still frame documentary of the history of the birds. Yeah, yeah. It's really, really well done. And it really feels like a conversation between you all. Um, in a, and it's, it's put together in a really fun uh, and enjoyable way. So... Um, I wanted to mention, too, that I know you're featured on uh, this great new Tom Petty live at the Fillmore. We were talking about yeah. the Fillmore. Uh, so there's a Fillmore 1997 box set that just came out recently. And uh, we're working with his estate to uh, exhibit a guitar and some clothing from of his from that run of shows. Um, do you have any recollections of, of, well, playing those shows in particular or or yeah. just working with Tom? 
Well, Tom and I were great friends, and he invited me out to San Francisco to do, I guess, about a week uh, of opening up for him at the Fillmore, and I was really happy to do it. I was just doing my own show, and they recorded my songs, and they put them in with this uh, compilation that they're doing. But it was wonderful just to see Tom and hang out with the Heartbreakers, and you know, we were all, all buddies and just hanging out. It was great. Yeah, and you're featured on, I think, four songs, and they're all, they sound great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, Roger, any final thoughts about the book or anything else you'd like to talk about? Well, you already you know, plugged it pretty well. There are three versions. There's a standard version and, and two autographed uh, deluxe versions. <laughs> the reason there are two autographed deluxe versions is because they gave, first of all, 3,000 sheets of paper showed up at my house <laughs> and they said, sign these. And we had to go through different pens to make sure they wouldn't bleed through. So, okay, I signed all 3,000. And then I sent them off to Chris, and he signed them. And then we sent them to Dave, and he went, I'm not going to do this. Man. <laughs> <laughs> so that created some rare, really rare items. That yeah, I about. think about he signed about 700 or something, other 3,000. It, it was quite a chore. It took a week or so to sign them all. And um, I've done a lot of work for the, this book, a lot of uh, Zoom interviews and like this. And um, I'm really happy with it. I, I think it's a wonderful project. I'm, I'm really pleased the way it came out. Yeah, I agree. It's really uh, something to be proud of. So congratulations on, on putting it together. It's really great. Um, and I, I really encourage everyone, like I said, to go out and get a copy, whether you buy it from the Rock Hall or not. But um, you can come to our museum, go to our online store at rockhall.com to buy a copy if you'd like, and we'll have the link below, um, but... Uh, well, so it, it is a limited edition. I mean, there are only so many gonna come out. So some people say, oh, it's too expensive, but it is, look at it as an investment because it's only gonna go up. Yeah, and it's a beautiful thing. If, if you're a Birds fan, you should, you should have a copy, I, I think. So mm -hmm. I'm glad I have one here. And we actually have uh, the one of the deluxe, we have the, the next uh, step up with the clamshell box. With the two signatures? Actually, I think I, maybe we got the, yeah, we have we the one the, with three, actually. So. We got the super, super yeah, deluxe. Super deluxe, that's right. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Great. Well, um, Roger, again, you know, thanks so much. This was really fun. And um, and Bird's music has meant a lot to me and all of us, you know, for so many years. So it's been a real honor for me to do this. So thank you for joining us. Okay, my, my pleasure. And um, again, I encourage everyone to get a copy of the book. Um, as I also said, um, for everyone, keep an ear out for this interview on Sirius XM in the coming weeks. And thanks to our partners at Sirius XM for that. And thank you all for tuning in. And uh, Roger, thank you again. My pleasure. I, I had a good time. <laughs>